Hi again, welcome to our last speech for today. A couple of days ago, I have received uh, two PDF files from a pen tester. So sending files to the sandboxes have become my new recent passion. That's why I'm especially interested in the last topic of ours by uh, Michal and Adam. So very warm welcome to our today's last speakers. And uh, their speech is Rackwoof Sandbox Open Source Self-Hosted Malware Sandbox in Hypervisor. Very warm welcome. So hello everyone. Today we have a pleasure to tell you a few things about the Dragwoof Sandbox project. And uh, today I have a pleasure to co-present with Adam Klisch. Hello, I'm Adam. Uh, I used to work together with Michał at Search PL, where we did the Dragwoof research. Now we mostly do it uh, off time. And nowadays I work at STM Cyber, where I do R&D, and I play CTS with the P4 team. And together with me is Michał. Hi. So I am a former expert at uh, CertPL, where I was doing a malware analysis automation and research on the Dragwoof project. And uh, right now I am just running my own company, which is mostly engineering the NFC solutions, blockchain stuff, and also uh, doing advisory on the IT security. So. Like first, let's jump to the very end. What is the end goal that we want to achieve? Like, what is the end goal that is currently achievable with this project? So, uh, here are a few assumptions about the demo that you will see just in a moment. In the demo, we have original Windows 7, which is just off the shelf, like the original uh, installation CD, together with the original game, which, which was also just bought in shop and nothing uh, of that was modified. And this is running under a very special host, which is uh, Ubuntu running under Zen hypervisor. And all the magic happens on the hypervisor level. Nothing is changed in the VM, and the VM doesn't have any agent. So basically, I am running my own my favorite game, which is called Heroes of Might and Magic 3 inside the Windows 7 VM. And uh, this is the program on the host. And we could see that the program on the host is able to see how much money I have uh, in the Heroes of Might and Magic 3. So I build some building, and then it says I have a little bit less money. Then I'm making another turn. It, it says I have more money. And uh, this is not everything. Like I am able to control the amount of money I have in Heroes 3. So, just this way. Yeah, and all of that happens on the host level, I mean on the hypervisor level. So the VM and the game is not aware of anything, it's just like intercepting the, the level of the volume bar and then regulating the amount of money in Heroes 3. But we are not here to talk about games and play games, so we would like to show Dragwolf's application to malware analysis in particular. <clears throat> OK, so first of all, uh, very quick information. We have malware. We have some, some form of executables. They all look differently. You have no idea if this is uh, a legit application or, per or perhaps a banking malware. But to explain it more easily, I will show you an example on the pharmaceutical level. Here you have three different packages with three different completely different brands. But if you read the fine print, it, it turns out the, the, mo the biggest impact is caused by the, in Polish, paracetamol. So if I, if I told you, yeah, I, I have this pill, do you want to take it? You would say, no, I don't know what it is. But if I told you I have a pill which contains, is mostly contained of paracetamol, then you would say, ah, yeah, that's a painkiller. I know what it does. So it's the same for the malware. You have packers, which, which are basically, uh, which basically pack your malware co core, which do does the malicious stuff. So from our point of view, we have there a lot of different executables, uh, which are all packed with different packers, so they look differently. But inside, most of them have 
very limited amount of uh, th there are very limited amount of malware families. So you have the malware core. You can easily say what the, that this is the malware and what it will do. So our goal is to get the is to uh, is to get the malware core. To do that, we need we our approach is to run the executable. So the packer will will do its magic stuff, and then it needs to transfer the execution to the malware, so we can do the malicious stuff. So, the the pipeline approach where we at Cert PL to unpack the malware, so we can later analyze it, is that we have an unknown executable, then we throw it into a thing called sandbox, which is in the title of this presentation. We obtain something called memory dump, which we'll jump in soon. But from this memory dump, we perform in identification, some data instruction, and we get the JSON out of it, because we like JSONs. Uh, and this JSON could look like this. So it tells you that this malware was, in fact, uh, emoted. Uh, here are the servers you can connect. Uh, here, here are the servers it will try to connect. So if you are running a, comp a company, you could, for example, block these IPs and make your, comp uh, make your company more secure. This is why we do it. So, uh, yeah, uh, w probably we all know what is the executable file and we know what is JSON, so what is the memory dump, the most tricky part of that uh, graph. So we understand the memory dump as a logical dump of the memory at certain point of time, and it's very important to also record the metadata associated with the memory dump, so we need the base address at which the dump was made, because otherwise we are not able to practically disassemble anything. And then we would like to know the reason of the dump as well, because, uh, yeah, simply we, we want to know like what happened that uh, we want to make a memory dump. It's uh, very important to place that in time appropriately. And as a profit, we, we basically get an unpacked malware or at least uh, sometimes. So then we hit a very interesting problem, like where, when to make a memory dump. The analysis is running for probably like five minutes, 10 minutes, and then we cannot simply make the memory dumps every second because this would like, e exceed all the possible disk space very quickly. So the very naive approach could be to just make the memory dumps randomly. So then what happens if we make a memory dumps randomly? Uh, this is some very simplified life cycle of the malware, so at the beginning of the analysis it's not yet running because we just have the system running, then it's not yet unpacked because it needs to pass all the crappy layers of the, of the packer, and then finally we have the malware core running, which is the point that's interesting to us, and then the malware could eventually exit after injecting somewhere, and then we are again out of luck and we are not able to make a dump. So basically, here we could make some useless memory dump, which will not bring us any further. Then we could make a useful memory dump uh, whenever we will catch the moment the, the, the malware core is really running, and then we make another useless memory dump basically after the, after the malware core has exited. So in order to have a good memory dumps, basically we need a good heuristics. And to have a good heuristics, we need to have a good behavioral monitoring because we need to observe uh, certain things that are happening inside of the virtual machines. So then there is a very simple question that you could ask us, like, why can't you use an ordinary sandbox? So, yeah, we can do that, but then we are hitting uh, a lot of malware monitoring problems, which is just another topic uh, we are facing with the malware analysis. So I've analyzed about three samples, and I have some conclusions from these samples, like, I mean, the, the, particular, the particular problems which were happening. So the first example could be a TrickBot sample. TrickBot is a well-known Trojan or Stealer. It comes in the form of packed x86, x64 binaries, and it's doing a process hollowing using direct system calls. So what does it mean it's using direct system calls? It's just making the system calls like by hand. So this is how it looks like in the assembly. So 
It should actually, like, when you want to create a file, you should, like, gently ask the system using some special method, like the driver has this uh, ZW create something, and it's not happening here. It's just making all of this by hand, which is extremely tricky. So the, basically, the normal sandbox is not able to observe that if we are using the like behavioral monitoring on the user mode level. Then we have a second sample, which is even more tricky. This is uh, Remcos. Remcos is a remote access Trojan. It also comes in the form of packed binaries. And it's, it's hollowing uh, SVC host using write process memory call. And then it's actually gently using the write process memory win API call. But then we are hitting another funny problem. Like, this is how Cuckoo Sandbox will hook the NTDLL, at least for Windows 7 x86. So basically, this is just finding the, like, finding the place, uh, finding the place where the, uh, where the function begins, and then overriding just the first byte of the function with unconditional jump opcode. This is the, like, this is the opcode for that in the machine code. And then another thing is that it uh, it diverts the flow by inserting the like the jump address to the to the hook. So this is how Cuckoo observes some Win API calls. And now we have a Remcos encounter to that. So this is the part of disassembled code from Remcos. And what Remcos is doing is that it's binary matching a first export. So it has a place where it's calling the NTDLL, and that place is that place is hooked by Cuckoo. So it is using some very like some some very funny method of binary matching the place where actually the first export starts in its machine code. And then the funny thing happens, it's for each export, it's trying to locate the third instruction. Like these exports are very schematic. So this is very simple. And then what it's doing, it's overriding the first instruction just to be sure that it's not hooked. So the first instruction is also very schematic. It's usually like MOF EAX1 or something like that. So it's just writing over that to, to make sure that the hook from Cuckoo is removed. And then we don't see uh, anything on the behavioral analysis for that. Uh, for that uh, sample. Uh, by the way, yeah, this was provided by Nazywam, who manually unpacked the malware for us to be able to show that uh, behavior. So thank you very much, Nazywam. Uh, and yeah, then we come to like the conclusion from that. So of course, you can implement the anti-unhooking. And they would basically implement anti-unhooking. Uh, anti and this is valid for like uh, all ends which are positive integers. So then, like th this is the this is the run which doesn't have much uh, sense to do. And uh, we have a third sample. We have a third example which is uh, Kronos. Kronos is a banking malware. It also comes in a packing uh, packed binaries. And then Kronos is very special because it's doing API hammering. So what is API hammering? Uh, it's basically making a pretty long uh, sequence of operations which doesn't have sense. So once you execute the malware sample, it's doing something useless, like manipulating the registry keys over and over, creating the directories, or at least uh, attempting to create the same directory like thousands of times. So this is the case with Kronos. It's creating some key on the registry like 40,000 of times. And then we could observe that I'm not even sure if that key is useful to anything. It's just like creating an uninstall information in registry for some random thing. And then funny thing that happens is that after you upload that to Cuckoo 30 ee uh, this is basically what happens. So you have the analysis finished, reported, and then you click on the analysis and it shows uh, error 424. We've tested that like a few days ago, and this is still the case with Cuckoo 30 e So uh, we were also testing that at the Cuckoo, which was uh, at 3rd PL. 
So then we, we had a little bit more insight uh, in what was happening. And then it just was like an existing connection closed by the remote host. So the agent that was tracing the VM has just disconnected for exact reason like not known. And then we have a more advanced sandbox, which is uh, triage. And uh, this is what happens when you upload that sample to triage. So then I need to say that uh, it actually successfully managed to analyze the sample, but then, yeah, the, the report looks a, a little bit obfuscated, like this is the pagination of the report. So, yeah, then we decided to do it on our own. Well, obviously, if, if you want to do something on your own, then you need to bring up this, this, this uh, meme. But I bring you a counter meme. By that, that's, that sign can't stop me because I can't read. So we will do it on our own anyways. So we had three options. We had the user mode, which we already had, and we've, we've shown its problems. There is the kernel mode. But yeah, it's already been done by others, and it's boring. So let's do it in the hypervisor mode, so the, the, the hard way. Uh, this showed me to be a bit more difficult than usually, but this is the journey. Uh, to do that, we, we, we use virtual machine introspection. What does it mean? What, what, it, what it is? Uh, when you have a virtual machine running on your PC, you don't know what's going on inside. There's a completely different operating system inside. So you can only see its raw memory. And it's pretty use, useless for you. But some very smart people created a project called VMI. Uh, and uh, what, it, what it does, it turns this random memory into, ooh, there's a process list inside. And we already know that this is a Windows 7 virtual machine, and we already see the process IDs and all the processes. And this is done completely without ingeration into the VM. It's just reading the, the memory, which the VM doesn't know about, and parsing the informa information from that. But this is only a stepping stone. This is, not, this is nice, but we need more information. To do that, we're using another open source tool, which is called Dragwoof, which is very similar to the sandbox name, you might notice. What it is, it's, it's, of, it's a black box binary analysis system, but in reality, this is a very clunky, and very, I'm saying very clunky, GDB slash S-trace for virtual machines. What I mean by that is that you run this program on your host, there is nothing changed in the VM, and your host knows when, for example, a syscall call was made, and you, and you also can parse the arguments that were passed in. So this is nice, but how does Dragwoof, how, how does it do that? Like, the VM is running. So the way Dragwoof does that, it's a very simplified version, is that for the interesting parts of memory, for example, syscall call handlers, Dragwoof prepares uh, another copy of this area of the memory, which is only executable. You can see the red one, the copy with, copy with breakpoint. And it, it puts an invalid instruction and a, a breakpoint in there. So when the VM runs the code, it will encounter the breakpoint, and Dragwolf will get the information that happened. But you might say, wait a minute. We've seen an example where people overwrote those breakpoints. Why, would why wouldn't it work here? Well, if you try to do any other operation than because there are only three, read, write, and execute. If you try to do any other than that, for example, if you try to read the memory or write to it, Dragwolf will swap back for just, just a second to the original page, allow you to read the original memory or write to it, and then just go back after one instruction. So it's, it's impossible or at least very hard to overwrite the breakpoints from the VM. Uh, and now that we know that, we should go back to the memory dumps part. So yeah, this is a little bit technical part about the memory dumps. So since we had a good base for VM monitoring and basically understanding what's happening inside of the VM, then we could go to the memory dumps. So how do we make a memory dump? There are a few simple techniques that are not extremely 
like complicated on that. So for instance, you could hook an uh, anti-protect virtual memory system call. And then you can basically check if the process handle is referencing to self. So the process wants to change the protection rules of its own memory. And then the tricky part is that you can just look at that memory buffer and if it starts with MZ. So this is basically the, the magic header of the exe file. So it's very probable that underneath you will find the unpacked malware. So this is just the case for a very generic unpacker that would uh, like do all the crazy stuff and then actually decode the, decode the real malware and have that binary somewhere in the memory. So we could dump and for some packers it is working. Yeah, here I would say this is not the rule like for the malware cores. So you can, you can have that emotet, remcos, trickbot, and uh, it's not about the malware core, it's about the packer that was used because each of them will like do the different tricks and we need a different heuristics even if we are looking at the same malware family. So this is very tricky. Another hook that you can make is to anti-free virtual memory. And this is also an example of an extremely simple hook because if the process wants to free its own memory, so then we could just parse the page tables to check if that first page under the, under the address of the memory being freed is uh, RWX. So if the memory is at the same time readable, writable, and executable. So this is not something that happens very often like in the normal world, but then if you have some packer which is not uh, doing its job very well, it will simply leave a buffer which is like free for doing everything and then we could uh, spot that during the cleanup and it also, it also works sometimes. So then uh, we might ask a question how to map a single pointer into a memory region because if we make the anti-free virtual memory, we basically have a single pointer, not the, not the actual memory region. But uh, yeah, our prototype of the function is just accepting the, the single pointer and the reason for the dump. So how to deal with that is just to look at the virtual address descriptors. That, that's some like interesting structure in the kernel, which has the like accounting for the virtual memory. So here you can uh, spot for each process, like what are the valid uh, regions for the virtual memory because it's not continuous and then uh, where that memory is mapped. So for instance, we have some crypt SP DLL loaded at certain address and ending at certain address. So if something tricky happens here, we basically know that that, that would be useful to practically dump this entire region, which will be usually like from few kilobytes to a few megabytes. So then another trick is that what, you, what if we don't have any pointer provided as an argument, so the malware can core anti-terminate process. This is very interesting heuristic because simply like the malware is telling that, okay, I finished. So yeah, probably it's unpacked at this point if it doesn't have any code that will scrub everything before exiting. So we also want to make a memory dump in such occurrence, but we don't have any pointer. So the solution is to perform a stack walk. And then some interesting, some more interesting problems will, will arise on that. So since we are already at the anti-terminate process, the guest VM is inside the kernel, but uh, the exact reason for calling was obviously on the user mode. So we need to know like where is the stack for the user mode? And this may seem very silly, but that's, that, that was extremely tricky to figure out. So for 64 bit, that's obvious it's in trap frame and we have this RSP register. And then the question is, when we are running the 32 bit program on the 64 bit system and we are inside the syscall, so where is the real stack pointer? And it's here. I don't know why, but yeah, it's, it's there. It was, a, it was a big trouble to, to find that out, actually. So then, okay, we have a stack. 
we have a stack pointer. Basically, we don't know anything about the stack because the stack is anyway the compiler specific. So how to actually reconstruct the stack? We've been trying a lot of different methods for that. And it turns out that the best method is just to walk through the last 500 bytes of the stack and look at the each possible like combination of four or eight bytes, and if it looks like if it looks like a legit virtual address, then we add that as a stack entry to analyze further. So maybe we will come up with some better algorithm someday. <coughs> but yeah, it's working right now. Yeah, so then we get to another topic, which is extremely hard when you are inside the hypervisor, which is called user mode hooking. So why do we need a user mode hooking when we are developing the malware sandbox in hypervisor? So basically, the hooks on syscalls are too low level for us. The malware is mostly operating in the user mode, and we don't see the user mode at all. So it's extremely tricky to Okay, maybe not extremely tricky, but we have already abstractions to observe the system calls on the hypervisor level. That's a, actually pretty close like between the, the system call and the hypervisor. And it's very distant between the, the user mode inside the VM and the hypervisor, which is looking on that. So yeah, you can emulate some of that because some Win API functions are mapping directly to the system calls, but not uh, not all of them. And some of them are not even doing any system calls at all. And we also want to see this Win API calls. And basically, yeah, the reason the, the user mode calls are needed for a behavioral analysis. And then also, after you have the the control over the user mode, you can do some funny things. So we have an, another demo, which is, again, the original Windows 7 off the shelf with the C-Lion downloaded directly from JetBrains. Nothing was modified. And then we have a C compiler stuck on that and the magic program on the host of that VM. So basically, what happens is that I have some program which is using cryptgen random inside of that VM, and I am building that program. So it will just generate some random numbers for me using cryptgen random. And we could see that the numbers are random indeed. So this is my host terminal. And right now I'm going to launch some funny program on the host. And we could recompile the program. And we see that the numbers are not random anymore. So yeah, I will close my program on the host, and we could observe that the numbers are becoming random again. So basically, what happened uh, here was that the, the hypervisor has uh, intercepted the call to the cryptgen random just directly inside of the VM, and it uh, unwinded the call like it was like hooked and not like the, the actual function was never executed. It was just zeroed the entire buffer and unwinded that from stack and continued execution. So the VM is totally unaware of that. And uh, that also allows to make it much easier to analyze the malware. Like we were not using that on the production, but I could imagine that if you have like all random sources being practically deterministic, this is like much easier to let's say decrypt a pickup. That will be the next demo. And uh, yeah, so how to make a user mode hooking at all? So we need to understand which system calls are issued when a new DLL is loaded, and that turned out to be like anti map view of section and anti protect virtual memory. These are the system calls that are associated with loading a DLL, which is made by a, a program inside of the VM on Windows. And uh, yeah, so we know that then, then we hit another problem, which doesn't happen like in the normal world. So DLLs are loaded, but they don't exist in the physical memory yet. And DragWolf cannot add a breakpoint on a memory which is not yet mapped in the system. So then we hit another like another very dirty trick. 
hopefully there is a function which allows to request a page fault, like mechanically. So you can inject a page fault to the virtual machine telling that the, like there is some piece of the system that needs to access a certain memory right now and you need to load that. But uh, yeah, actually this is like synthetic except uh, injected from the hypervisor. And thanks Bitdefender for providing that for the libvmi. That was extremely helpful. So then how the user mode hooking looks like in such a kind of hypervisor. This is basically how the DLL looks like in the memory when we, when we observe the DLL being loaded. So you could read the PE header and basically nothing else. So let's go for it. We could parse the PE header. We could find the image export directory. And this, the second piece is actually not guaranteed to even exist uh, in the physical memory at that point. So if it's not readable, then we basically just inject a page fault uh, to each page which contains the export directory. And then we finally can parse the export directory and find the symbol of the function that is interesting to us and we want to hook it. And of course, that function would also not uh, physically exist until it's first time called because we have this lazy loading mechanism for the Windows memory. So then we need to find the virtual address for that and inject the page fault just again to, to force Windows to actually load uh, all of that memory. And then we hit yet another crazy problem, like what if the DLL would be purposely corrupted and the pointer to the image export directory is invalid, for instance. So then we inject the page fault and we crash the entire system because uh, yeah, the page fault was for a memory which cannot be provided. And then we get a crash uh, inside of the kernel just immediately. So this is a very simple trick for the malware to detect us. So then the solution is like the, the poor man's solution to hook the key system service handler. So this is something which happens like very, like a moment before the BSOD. And we could just pretend that nothing has happened. So the, the algorithm looks like that. So we start, we check the flag whether we were injecting a page fault recently which is called our fault with the unders uh, underscore. And then if it's our fault, then we are just returning a zero and unwinding the exception handler out of the kernel and continuing execution. If no, then we just let the virtual machine crash by passing this to the system handler. So basically, yeah, th this is just something like that. Like this is, I think this is the best visualization of the, what, what, what happens behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, so then we hit yet another crazy problem, which is that uh, DLLs are shared between processes and copy on write can occur when the DLLs are overridden because simply each program doesn't have the physical copy of each DLL in its own memory. That would be extremely huge waste. So these are shared. And uh, then you need to hook the mechanism in Windows which is responsible for copy and write. This is tricky again because you need to rewrite all the hooks to the new physical pages after the memory has replicated. And then we are trying to find, we were trying to find a good test program, a good malware which will be overriding its own DLLs. And it turns out that the Internet Explorer is the best test program for copy and write ever because the Internet Explorer is actually overriding its own DLLs. This is some very tricky mechanism to ensure compatibility across different Windows versions. So it is just writing over its own DLLs to inject the layer called shim for compatibility. And it's doing a, a whole lot of that. So this is the list of the DLLs that Internet Explorer like knows better and it's, it's overriding that. So then, yeah, when we're talking about uh, Internet Explorer, we could show also something like that. So thanks for uh, using the user mode hooks. We are able to, I will play that again. 
we are able to hook SSL generate master key, which is a user mode uh, call in the crypto DLL, and we could easily like dump the master key when the SSL connection happens. You can paste that key into the Wireshark, and then you basically decrypt all the traffic with, without any problem. So this is, again, a very useful thing for analysis. There is a like ready, ready plugin in Dragwolf for that called TLS Mon, and it's able to trace the, the entire TLS traffic it will, if it was made using the normal Windows uh, TLS API. And then we jump into another funny topic, which is Intel processor trace. Well, this, this is still work in progress. It has all the bits working, but not combined together. So this is a sneak peek. Uh, first of all, we found this feature on the Intel processors, and then authors of the Zen hypervisor, which we are using down, down deep below, uh, in the ocean said that this is going to be interesting, to say the least. So what do we want to do? Let's assume that we already have the memory dump, or for some reason it didn't happen, whatever. We want to make the analysis easier for the malware analyst. Already, uh, to do that, we are going to, why, why are we going to do that? First of all, you, you've, we've, let's assume that we've dumped the malware core, but malware usually obfuscates itself as well. So here we have uh, malware which is doing uh, import address, the dynamic impo import address resolving, which means that it doesn't have raw calls to the APIs. For example, it doesn't just directly use NT create file. What it does is asks Windows during runtime, hey, tell me where the API is, and then it already, uh, and then it uses that. Uh, it looks something like this in the code, and it makes analysis a lot harder because you do not know, you see a call to somewhere, and you do not know what the function name is. So it's a bit harder to reverse engineer it. So what we are going to use is something called Intel processor trace, which is a silicon feature so it's like a hardware feature in the new, uh, new uh, Intel processors, which allows us to record all the necessary metadata during execution and save it for later. And this allows us to combine it together with our memory dumps to have the entire execution of the, of the malware that happened in Sandbox. And that includes, for example, here we have a jump and we see that in the metadata, it is, it's, it's included that the jump was actually taken. So we, we, we can completely skip what happened in the, in the underneath. Also, if you call some virt virtual functions, for example, you call in a register where you, uh, where you calculated the address where you jumped to, it's also saved, which makes analysis a lot easier. What it looks like is something like this. So you have... Uh, Sorry, what it, what it have what it is is you have uh, Intel does, uh, you have a disassembly of what's going on live, uh, and then because we do not want to uh, analyze what's going on in the operating system because that's usually boring, we disable the processor trace. We only log the information that oh yeah the, the system call happened here, and this is these are all the arguments you can see the. This was uh, uh, the process. The, this, this call was anti-close, and it, the process name was provided, and stuff like that. And it goes back to process to dumping the assembly. Uh, why? How it looks from the analysis view? Well, you have all. You can call or call or all the path that was taken by the malware, which is nice. You know what happened, so you do not spend 90 years reversing wrong part of the binary. And also, the, the, the goal is to change this, which is something, into this, where you have the comments with the names of the functions that were called, which is really nice. And finally, we get to the drag with sandbox, which is the topic of this presentation. What it is is basically drag with engine, but it's made for humans. It has a not the best, but it has a web interface. It has pretty easy installation. Uh, it, al it already cons uh, has all the sample queuing, and you do not need superhuman powers to use it. This is 
it looks very bare bones. This is not the latest screenshot. But it does have all the system calls and stuff like that. It's also a bit customizable on the user side. And the best of all, it's fully open sourced and free, which is the best price. Uh, there is a small disclaimer we need to do is Dragwolf is not a magical box that you can buy in your company and it will make it secure. Like Dragwolf will not tell you if what, what executed inside is a malware. It is not designed for that. What it does is it provides critical information for your malware analyst that the, later, that the data needs processing later. It's pretty in a pretty good format where it's easy to implement your, in your automation chain, which is the biggest part as we used it in CertPL, but as I said, it's not a magical solution. So, in summary, we have the links to the open source tools we are using, we're missing the Zend link, but we have some thanks slides because this project is very hard and it took a lot of people. Uh, very warm, warm th thanks to the reverse engineering team of the CertPL, which helped us debug all the binaries which didn't work, uh, mainly Nazivam, PESREC, and MSM. Also, uh, we need to credit other team, other members of the team that developed this project, so Sasha, Chiva, and Constante from ZPL. Uh, we also need to credit some other people that didn't work with us at CERT, so Maciej Makotowicz, which whom provided a lot of good characteristics for, the, for when to dump the malware. Uh, Tamas for starting the Dragwolf project and still maintaining it to this day. And uh, Matthew Taral for making the libvmi and maintaining it as well. And that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. The slides are under the link or, and the QR code. Yeah, so thank you. Yay. So oh, thank you guys for, for the explanation, actually it's really nice. I do have two, two questions. So the first one, uh, which is the programming language in which you, you develop this, so Python or, I mean, uh, if, I, if I want to contribute, which is the? Uh, this, uh, the because this is in the hypervisor, it needs a very, to be very low level. Mm -hmm. So this is mostly C, C++. But we are. We have some. We have a. We have a feature in our in our repo, but it's not fully baked. Uh, what it allows you is to. Uh, it's is to run Python scripts uh, as a part of the sandbox, so you can. Uh, you can have a, at a breakpoint or a some. For example, we have somewhere a demo, but we don't have it on presentation. You can breakpoint, for example, or on internet URL open with Python. Uh, for example, call, go to call to some API called, for example, spam house or other. Check if this is uh, an add, and just you can add blocker, but on hypervisor level, which is fun. So yeah, for now C and C++. Maybe later Python integration. It's still work in progress. Yeah, because uh, I was asking that because one of the things that I, for example, you were talking about triage. One of the things that I like about that sandbox is that you can, they, they have like a lot of config, uh, config extractors. So usually when I analyze a malware, I try to create some small scripts. And if I can adapt those scripts to a sandbox such as this, so that's going to be uh, nice. So in that scenario, so do you think uh, there is going to be any kind of, um, at least in the, in the backlog of this project, any kind of integration of so, such uh, things or? There already is integration, which like SearchPL already has the whole pro malware processing pipeline, and Dragwolf Sandbox is only a small piece of it. It already has all the queuing and stuff like that. Already all the ex extractors. There's also a web page uh, malware M MWDB, which is, you can uh, you can visit it at MWDB SearchPL, which is a browser for your malware needs. It already has uh, integration for config files. And it's all pr the post-processing is all done in Python. And this part in C and C++, 
uh, unless you want to con contribute to the front end, which is the pain, <laughs> so we're welcoming all the JS devs. <laughs> Yeah, but if you would want to self-host and have the config extractors, there is an, another open source project at CertPL, which is called, I'm not sure, maybe just extractor? Yeah, uh, but it's, it's there. Ah, it's the, the, okay. whole, the whole pipeline which glues everything together is called Carto, Carton, which translates to cardboard in English. It's, it, it's, it's an actually, it's a play on the name because uh, Everyone writes their own small script to extract all the config from the malware. And at CertPL, we use this, this magical pipeline to just glue all the scripts together so they work. So Dragwolf Sandbox actually underneath uses Carton. It just doesn't show it to you. But uh, there, I believe if you can, you can start your entire pipeline with probably on one server with installing two deb files for the Dragwolf Sandbox, and then running one Docker file, Docker Compose, and you'll have entire search PL malware pipeline on your one server. Yeah, so the only remaining thing is that you need to write the modules for the malware extractor. Or if you would obtain them from search PL guys, like you need to have like very good, like very good base for that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that's great. So I'm, I'm going to take a look at those. Thank you, guys.